after our worship service. Sunday school classes on your way. After you've had your cup of coffee, please be sure to come to one of the classes. Epic youth this evening, please come. And Jordan is still, as always, looking for adult volunteers. We continue to pray for his ministry at the school district with impact. I understand that it is having an impact so we thank you, Jordan, and we praise God for your leadership. Men and dinners, uh, not this week, but the next one will be on June 7th. On June 3rd, the Dow Committee will meet. On the 12th, the trustees will meet. And on the 20th, we will have church council. Mark your calendar. The Hughes family had a wonderful blessing this week. Cash Theodore Collins was born to Jasmine and Austin, uh, I keep wanting to call him Ashton, Austin, on May 15th. So congratulations to them. And Kevin has a very brief announcement that he would like to make. I told him to be brief. He can't. The trustees have been talking about this for a while, and, and quite honestly, it's been since prior to COVID that we actually got together and had a cleanup work day for the entire church. Uh, there, the, the, there's some cleaning, cleaning that needs to be done here in the sanctuary. And I know that Blair's getting a group of ladies together to do the kitchen. Uh, those are the primary areas inside. Outside, uh, general cleaning up, sprucing up, trimming uh, for anyone, mostly the men, but anyone who would like to come, 
Cleanup day has been set at June 3rd from 8 o'clock in the morning until noon. So uh, I don't have sign up sheets ready yet. They'll be here by the end of tomorrow, the, the day. And uh, you don't need to wait until June 3rd if you have some free time to come in and do whatever needs to be done. So if you would mark that on your calendar and uh, we'll make it happen. Let us join together. Kumbaya.
we are blessed that we can call on that name of Jesus. Always Jesus, always present, always listening, always here. Jesus, only Jesus. Let us pray together. Oh Lord God, we have come together on this beautiful spring morning. Yesterday's rain refreshed the soil as new seeds were put into the ground and they would come forth with new life. The sun came out and this morning, such a beautiful, beautiful start to the day. And it is beautiful that we can be together as the body of Christ to give you our praise and our worship with one another. And we ask that we might feel your presence with us, not only in this hour, but as we leave this place. As we go into the world, may we be your, your hands, your feet, and your witnesses. May individuals be drawn to Christ because of our witness. And because of your inspiration, you convert, we witness. Lord, this morning we give you our thanks and our praise for the gift of new life. For Jasmine and for us and for baby boy Cash Theodore. We pray that you would be with them and bless that young boy that he might grow in a way that is pleasing to you. And at the other end of life, we ask that you would be with the family of Marilyn Miller as Rick and the children say their final goodbyes to their mother. We do ask this morning that you would be with those individuals who are dealing with health issues, whether it's recovering from an illness or recovering from surgery or anticipating surgery. Please be with them. We are grateful, Lord, that Pastor Terry is with us this morning. We ask that you would have your hand upon him as he brings us the message. And we pray for Pastor Lee. So much is going on in her life from the transition that we are experiencing with personal matters with her family. We just ask that you would be with her and give her the strength that she needs. We pray for this congregation, Lord, as we transition to the global church. And we continue to pray for the United Methodist Church. Lord, we pray for for responders in the military and are grateful for each one. And we pray for our political leaders and ask that you would be with them also. And Lord, together, as we give you our praise and our worship, we ask that you would hear our prayer as we join our hearts and our voices together and pray the prayer that you taught your disciples when you said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I would like to welcome Pastor Terry Shaughnessy with us this morning. And our musical offering this morning is entitled, Hallelujah, by and by.
but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now Jesus prays that he said this. He looked up to heaven and prayed. Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer. But they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now. But I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the word has, world has hated them. But they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of them. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory, the glory you gave, have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, through the, the world, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known in order that the love that you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. As you are able, please stand as we sing together the first three verses. Uh, oh, Jesus, I have promised. It's number 396 in your inbox. If you follow along now.
In this case, I led you astray. <laughs> so, as the leader, let's back up to near to the heart of God. It was good practice. It was. Good practice. It was. And it's number 472 in the good book. Near to the heart of God. One more time, all right? Let's try it. Very well may have. You've experienced 
those moments when you come full circle? You have those full circle moments? Well, back when I was 16 years old, you know, we're talking quite a while ago, my first job as a 16 year old was as a box boy and a cashier at the Riverside Market in Franklin, Pennsylvania. Now, the Riverside Market doesn't exist there. The building is there now. I think it's a VFW that meets there. But that was my first job. And here I have come 60 years, full circle, and I'm working in a, super, in a market, in a, in a grocery store, as a stalker and as a cashier. Full circle. This, for me, this morning, is another full circle moment. When I first went into the ministry, and as a student pastor, serving outside of Durham, North Carolina, where I was going to Duke University, the seminary, I was serving a two-point charge. So early in the morning, I would go to the one church, the little white church, it's not the Wildwoods, it's in the midst of the tobacco fields through North Carolina, but I would preach at that service, in that little church, a church with no running water, and an outhouse out back, and still to this day, as far as I know, there's no indoor water, the outhouse is still out back, and that church was supported by eight older women. Financially, spiritually, they kept that church open. That was my first preaching assignment, the first thing in the morning. Then I would get in my car, and I would drive through the tobacco fields, and about 10 miles away, and I would go to Mount Tabor, United Methodist Church from Riverview, and drive up the hill to the church where it was located. And it was there that I'd get out of my car, and some of the men were standing under the oak tree out front smoking their cigarettes. I'd say, good morning, guys, it's time to go in. They'd put out their cigarettes, and they'd follow me in the door, and away we would go with worship. That's how I started out. Now, never in over the 30 plus years, 38 years of serving churches, both in the Western Pennsylvania Conference and in Florida, have I ever had more than one church to serve at a time. And here I am this Sunday doing what? Back to two churches on a Sunday morning. It's a full circle moment. And I feel so blessed that you are a part of that circle this morning, that we are a part of that circle this morning. Now having said that, I want to get into the text, and I want to spend as much time there as possible. And I know you've heard me say this before, that um, I don't like to tie to the clock. Uh, I, I, I worship as a tradition where that doesn't happen. I'm used to having the pastor speak for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and it's just part of what we do. Um, more than that, however, I believe that when we allow ourselves to be led by the Holy Spirit, that the time really, you know, is His and not ours. And last time I was here and I was surprised when he called me back, I remember we were quite over the time on that day, but today, you know, I, I have to be, unfortunately for me, I need to be a little conscientious about the time, because at 10.30, and I will be looking, I'll need to walk out the door, so if I didn't get the breach this morning, it ain't going to happen this week, because <laughs> i got to walk out the door, get in my car, and drive to Cambridge Springs, and I know those of you who have made that trip before, if you get behind a tractor, which can happen on any day of the week at any time, most likely you're not going to get around that tractor. So they're already cued that if I'm not walking in the door by 11 o'clock, they're going to start praise music. And then I'll walk in and pick up where, where I need to be. So I apologize that if 1030 comes along, I'll bring it to a, a close and, and out I'll go. But it's not because I'm tired of being with you. That's not the case at all. It's just because that's what I have to do today, to take care of what God has given me. And during the singing of song, I have to sing. I got to get into the sermon. At the singing of song, 
Those of you who have been part of the church and our fellowship together for many years probably remember this day. Remember part that the, the church we had in the park on Sunday? And the music was absolutely phenomenal. And I remember standing before those of us, oh, those who were there that day, getting ready to eat. We worshiped, we sang the songs, they were absolutely so uplifting. And I, I made some sort of comment about, we don't need to go any further. No sermon today because we've already taken care of that through this wonderful singing. You know, at this point in time, with the music that has been sung for us and as we've sung together, the message I believe that God has in store for us this day, it has been given to you. And so for all intents and purposes, I can say amen, pass the offering plates, and I say that because that was the largest one offering that we've ever had at one service. But I said, no preaching today. <laughs> so... How do you want it? <laughs> How do you want it? This text this morning is worthy of some preaching. In fact, when I looked at what this text was for this Sunday, on this Ascension Sunday, I was surprised to see it in the lectionary as being the gospel text for the Sunday before Jesus was to leave this earth once and for all until he comes again on this Ascension Sunday, which this Sunday is. Ascension Day was on Thursday. We celebrate it today. When Jesus leaves this earth and is lifted up into God's heavenly kingdom to live with him at the right hand of God for eternity until he returns again. This prayer, when you look at the, where it is in the gospel according to John, where, where John has placed it by the Holy Spirit's leading, comes before Jesus' arrest, his crucifixion, his death, and the resurrection. In fact, up until chapter 13, which precedes these 13, 14, 15, and 16, those four chapters from John all occur while they are in the upper room together. Everything leading up to that point has taken almost three years in John's writing. Now we are at the point of just a short period of time that is being represented in 13 through the end of John's Gospel account, where Jesus is resurrected. But it's in these verses, in these chapters here, that Jesus speaks to the disciples words that he knows in his heart that they need to know before he leaves them. Now, that doesn't negate anything that he said before that. Because certainly all of the teachings in those three years leading up to this point were important. They were Jesus sharing the word of God with God's people in a variety of ways. Through his preaching, his teaching, the miracles that he performed, the healing, all of that was to speak to who he was as the son of God without proclaiming that he was the son of God, because when he did that, it got him in trouble, of course, and it got him killed. But these particular chapters, and in this particular chapter, after those four, Jesus is offering to them in the small setting where it's just them. These words that he wants them to get, because he knows what's coming and they don't and he wants them to be prepared for when he is crucified and ultimately when he leaves them on this earth so we have in this chapter 17 this high priestly prayer 
as it is referred to by many biblical scholars. Some say it's the Lord's Prayer. And others will say, no, it's not the Lord's Prayer. And that's in Matthew. And Jesus prays as the prayer that we prayed this morning. And that's We call it the Lord's Prayer. But that was Jesus answering the disciples to just to pray. He said, you pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven. This is Jesus' prayer. This is the Lord's Prayer. Jesus prays this long, profoundly spiritual, theological, uplifting, preparing prayer that he prayed all throughout his ministry. And he prayed often throughout his ministry. John talks about it. The other gospel talks about it. How Jesus would remove himself from the crowds and go someplace and pray. He prayed from the cross three times. Short prayers. You can go through the gospel accounts and you will see time after time where Jesus prayed. But none of those prayers were like this prayer. Not a one of them was like this prayer. This prayer was personal for the disciples. And he starts out, in fact, as I have written down here, that it is, this prayer is, is good. The greatest of all time prayers. The greatest prayer recorded in, in the Bible. The greatest prayer that Jesus ever prayed. It is unique. It is the prayer of the Son of God to the Father. And I'll say something there about that as well. You have Jesus having a conversation, an intimate conversation with his Heavenly Father. In fact, there are some commentators that say that when he addressed God at the beginning, that he, he said, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, Abba is translated as Daddy. And it stands for a strong personal relationship that Jesus has with his Heavenly Father. And he lifts his eyes, as the text tells us, he lifts his eyes to heaven, to God, to connect with God as he prays this, this, this wonderful prayer. And I would say at this point that this prayer is um, not out of order by any means. That although it may seem that way by the liturgical calendar, I can see the importance of this prayer being a topic of, of scripture and also our consideration on this Ascension Sunday when Jesus is leaving to go to be with his Heavenly Father to be as a reminder to the disciples, not just then, but to us today, as those who have been discipled by those who have gone before us and who were discipled by the uh, apostles so long, long ago. So it's really, even though it seems out of order, it's right in order. Because I think that you and I need to be reminded of a fact that you and I are being prayed for. Isn't it an amazing feeling to have somebody pray for you? You know, oftentimes we say the words after we've had a conversation with someone and what's going on in their lives and we say these words, I'll hold you in my prayers. Do you ever find yourself wondering, I wonder if they really are going to pray for me? And how many of us say those words and don't follow through with actually praying for that person? But what about the experience of being prayed for in the presence, in the presence of the one for whom you pray? There's something special about that. As you sit next to that person, and you hear those words being offered up to God on your behalf. 
And I hope that you've had many of those experiences. And if you haven't at this point, I hope that you will have one soon. Because there are words that cannot describe what that feeling is like. And right there, maybe even holding your hand, the person is praying for you. I will say this to you this morning. That's happening right now, my friends. Because Jesus Christ, our Lord in heaven, is beside you right now where you sit in this place. And he knows your needs. More intimately than you know your needs yourself. And in these moments, he's praying for you. He's praying for you. And I hope that as you hear those words, that you will take them in and allow them to be for you words of assurance. That no matter what you are walking through, that you have at least one who is indeed praying for you in those moments of every step that you take. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now granted, there's power in prayer. When we gather our hearts and our voices together, we pray for one another. But there's nothing like the power that is in the prayer of Jesus Christ that he offers up for you and for me. That's what he's doing in this text, by the way. I've got a book of notes. I've got ten minutes. <laughs> I got to go back. <laughs> because I got to tell you, this, this, this is an aside, but it's right where I am with the text. I got to tell you, when I read this text and I started studying this text, and you can't see my Bible very well, but it is marked up. This is the prayer. I have it highlighted, I have it red inked, I have it black inked, I have arrows drawn, I have asterisks. I hope that you will take your Bibles when you walk out of here today and reread this prayer and read it with a heart that is open to receive the words that Jesus is praying. And especially as he prays for you as his disciples in the world today. As I've studied this prayer these last couple of weeks, especially. And as, as I written my notes, and I have a pile of notes on the, on the floor next to my desk. This morning I got up at 4 o'clock after I got done walking Duke and I started going through things, trying to make some sense out of, uh, out of all of this. And I was throwing papers down and shuffling papers together and stapling papers together. And this is what I got. But you know, here's where we are. There is so much that is in here that I believe that each and every one of us needs get from this prayer. And when I say I need to come back and, and be with you and, and preach more through this prayer, it is that one of my favorite preachers to listen to is a Steve Lawson. He's been preaching for 40 years. He's a powerful preacher. And he preaches the Bible. He preaches the Word of God. He doesn't pick some topic and then go for it. He preaches the word of God. That has been my goal, and it's my goal with this text, is that we go through it verse by verse. He went through it verse by verse, 26 verses. That's 26 weeks on one chapter. People that left that study after 26 weeks, they all got a t-shirt. I survived. <laughs> I'm not saying 26 weeks worth, but I'm saying that there is, there, is, there is so much here that is so worthy of our understanding.
understand it. And I think if I have to leave you with, with one theme out of this, when you go through my notes, you see this? There's a hole in that, the paper's yellow. It's been around a while. I preached on this text on May 31st, 1987. I preached on this text in this church on May 23rd, 1993. Anybody remember that song? <laughs> been preached on before. Here's the thing. I want to leave you with one thing out of this text this morning. It would be how Jesus says time and again how he prays for the disciples. He prays, he says, not the world. See, the world is that which is considered sinful. He's not praying for the world here. He's praying for the faithful. He's praying for those who are out in the world, in the world, not of the world, but in the world where we live. He's praying for us that we will remain faithful to his word, that we will be an example to the world of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, of what it means to love as Christ loved, of what it means to be in unity with one another as Christ is in unity with the Father. They are one, it's said time and time again, as we are one in Him. And it's in that unity with Christ that we have the most powerful witness of all to the world around us that's looking at us individually as disciples of Christ and together as the Christian church. What's the message that we are sending the world? How is our evangelism going? as we share the love of Jesus Christ and share everything that we say and do to the glory of God. That's what Jesus did. Every single thing that he did and all that he said was to God's glory. And the last thing that Jesus did for the glory of God was to die on the cross for you and for me. That was his final act. And why did he do it? Not to bring glory to himself, but to bring glory to God for what God has been able to do through his death and ultimately his resurrection to eternal life. And friends, I will say to you at this point in time, every single one of us, every single one of us, and experience eternal life right here, right now. We don't have to wait for that day when it's all over, so to speak. But we can experience eternal life in this time, in this moment, by how we are living our lives. Are we living those lives in relationship with God the Father? For it's living in his presence and with him walking through our lives together with us and us getting as close to him as we possibly can that we experience firsthand what eternity is. It is life with God. Life with God in the here and now. How do we do that? Actually, it's pretty easy. We just have to do it. Spend time in God's Word. Because in God's Word, you will find the eternal God. And know everything you need to know about Him and be pulled into an intimate relationship with Him. It's not just about knowing about, it is knowing. <laughs> knowing that comes from that relationship that you're locked with him. So you spend time in the Word, and you pray, and you pray. We are encouraged, the church where I attend, to find our chair, and to spend time in our chair with God. There are so many distractions in our world today. We need that time with him in order to experience the 
eternal life with him today. And we experience all that comes with that gift. This is an inner joy and peace for the living out of our days that we're often living with turmoil and chaos. There's so much more. So much more. And I pray for each and every one of us that we would allow ourselves to be open to the Lord's touch through the Holy Spirit. That He would meet us where we are. And that He would sanctify, that He would set us apart, that He would make us holy. So that we can be the disciples of Christ in the world that we have been called to be and equipped to be, all for the glory of God. Next week, when the church gathers, the Christian church gathers, when we gather on Pentecost Sunday, just as a refresher course, Pentecost Sunday is that Sunday that Jesus promised would come when he said that he would send the comforter, that he would send an advocate for us, that he would send his presence to us. And it's that Sunday where the Holy Spirit comes in power and wind and, and flames upon the disciples again gathered in the, in the upper room and they were empowered to be the church of Jesus Christ in the world. God empowered each and every one of us to be, to be, call us to be his missionaries wherever we are. And that people will come to know of the love and the grace and all that comes with faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. <laughs> Final word, and I'm done. And I promise not to scream. I wrote these words as part of my conclusion today. The disciples, indeed, had no idea what was really happening when Jesus prayed this prayer the first time. But brothers and sisters, we know, we know, we know the whole of the story, and we get to hear Christ's hope and Christ's call on this earth. Christ's obedience to us on this side of the cross are the end of the Trinity, the sign and symbol of his obedience. What about ours? I'm grateful, I wrote, that Jesus took time to pray for you and me before you went to the cross to die for us. I'm grateful that most of this prayer declares that which was done for me and in me and through me and in you and through you. However, I would just remind us this morning that part of it that coming together as one in Christ and the love are dependent upon us being willing to yield his will for our lives. Yielding our will to his will for our lives. Friends, Christ is praying for you even now and he's praying for you every day. It's been my honor and my blessing to be with you for this short time this morning. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus into the world to save us from our sins and to enable all who believe in him to be witnesses to the truth of your word and to become ministers of peace and reconciliation wherever we find ourselves. 
I pray that all who are called by your name would be knit together in the unity of your Holy Spirit, and that we would be united together in the truth of your glorious gospel of grace. Use us as we pray to tell a lost world of your wonderful plan of redemption through the finished and glorified work of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Peace be with you all. Jesus, I am God. us, and he calls us his own. Amen. 